Hello all, good evening and welcome to another session with me, Varun at Odin School. And in this session, we will start talking about data science with Python. And we would be looking at the second part of data manipulation. We will be looking at where exactly we left at in the data manipulation one, which is in the last video. Now going forward, we all know why we use Python and how using Python is very important nowadays. And we are now exactly working on Python uh, using principles or concepts of uh, data science, uh, wherein we have, again, a split of these concepts into data extraction, visualization, manipulation. So we are beginning with the crust of it, or we are beginning with the foundational level of it. And guys, to give you an introduction about Odin School, we here are a technology upskilling platform and we would help you continuously acquire new skills. Thereby, you could stay skilled and stay ahead. And my name is Varun and I come with an experience of seven years. And over these seven years, I've been working as a developer and a trainer as well. And thanks to the organizations that I've been working with, I've been able to gain knowledge on languages like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, R language, Python, etc um it's it, it's completely credits to you know, these different organizations so now going forward the agenda of this session will be to understand what is merge the joint statements and how do we plot using pandas now when i say how do we plot using pandas i would also want you to understand that pandas and matplotlib uh, and numpy they're all interdependent on each other Right, guys, this is a very basic fact known to all of us. So, yeah, now let us go ahead and understand uh, join and merge. That is where we drop that, and then we'll again come back to Pandas. But then, just to give you all a small introduction, Pandas is one of the most popular Python library that we've been. Uh, um, that's been in existence uh, with Python over quite a long time. And it features an array kind of tools for handling data and also analysis in Python. And Pandas also has a visualization functionality that leverages the matplotlib library. Right, guys, now this is important in conjunction with its core data structure, that is the data frame. Okay, now whenever you're working on data frame, you could get associated with matplotlib, which is another very important library that we would be looking at in Python. So these are the two important libraries uh, that we could use to come up with data visualization. Right, so now it is quickly without wasting time move into the anaconda navigator right so here i would like to start with pandas uh, we would be looking a bit in depth and um, because this hands-on uh, there's very less scope for us to actually use a pen right so we'll start and we'll begin understanding uh, the coding part of it so here when we talk about pandas guys pandas they are weighted as panel data and um, it is a multi-dimensional data wherein we involve measurement over time as well right and it's created in 2015 by west mckinney and it features uh, talking about uh, its features you a uh, greater look at it it is not just for that it can also be used uh, uh, or it also uses arbitrary matrix and time series matrix as well well, guys, so this is where or this is how pandas can be used. Now, when we yeah, when we start working with pandas, uh, the first step still remain the same. You would be importing pandas as PD, which is the most important library. And here I've created a small data set with some random numbers like five, two, three, and four. All right. And then I'm creating another series with PD dot series. Now here, uh, this series one is a variable, while this series, which I'm talking about, is a functionality. Guys, please understand the difference between functionality and uh, series, okay, or functionality and a variable, okay? So that is what we are doing here. That's exactly what we're trying to here, uh, you know, understand here. All right. So here, I, as you can see, I have my data and then I have my series after which I'm passing pd.series into which I'm passing my data. Now, this data has the numbers or has the elements that we have created. And now when I check the output, 
you would see I have A, B, C, D. But then, but then, guys, A, B, C, D is because of this. A, B, C, D is not because of the actual step. Now, when I use only a series, let me comment on this as well. I'm old. Yeah. So now, when I use series, you would see that now my answer will vary. So here you see, by default, we have 0, 1, 2, 3. And these values are attached to 5, 2, 3, and 4. Right, but then you may always overwrite them or you may always change them using one simple functionality that is index. And when I add index, the answer is now a bit different. And here you would be having the indexes marked as A, B, C, and T because that is something that we are overwriting from here. Good. Now back to the second step. Oh, sorry, um, now uh, going forward to the second step, that is how do we create a data frame in the first place? All right, and whenever we would want to create a data frame, guys, the functionality used is data frame as well. All right, and this function, now what is data frame used for? Or uh, is data frame of any use or how would data frame bring about a difference? See here, you can see it is a two dimensional mutable and heterogeneous tab tabular data. Right? I hope this is straight. Now, if you have any queries, guys, please feel free to comment it in the comment section below, below the description. And here, the data structure also contains labeled access, that is rows and columns by default. Now, we'll see that. Arithmetic operations can get aligned on both row and column labels. That is another functionality of uh, your data frame. Then it is also thought of as a dictionary like container for series objects. So honestly, a data frame has the potential to do a lot. You can also open this in an external window and see this in detail. Right? And that is exactly what I'm trying to tell you here. Um, let me just close this. We'll again come back to it. All right. So here I am considering four random numbers again. One, two. Um, this is my pandas. And here I'm considering a data frame. And now, it, as you can see, whenever I use my data frame, it would automatically sort them into rows and columns. But that is not the case when we use series C. We do not have any highlighting or we don't have anything like that. Let me just pull. Now, if you see, when I hover through them, there's no difference. But when I hover through these, I am able is a marking on them. Correct? This is when or this is how we create a data frame. Now, just a while back when we were talking about a data frame, we saw that data frame can also use for can also be used for dictionary like functions. Correct? So here I would be taking XYZ. I'm taking my toys as uh, one of the key, which has some values, and the second key would be count. Right, so it's it's basically something related to the number of toys in a store, right? And these are the different toys I have. I have trucks, I have cars, and I have bikes in these quantities. So this is basically got two columns and multiple rows, or multiple rows and multiple columns. And here I'm again uh, taking a data frame, and this is still adjusted or readjusted into a tabular data arrangement. So this is the speciality of a data frame. You could also see, uh, you could also use this for a simple series, taking an index in that very line only. And that is how I came up with A and B of uh, 6 and 12. Then in my next step, uh, we've already seen these and we're just trying to understand them a bit better now. Because when we go into the merge and join next, 
we would have concepts that we might borrow from very simple data frame structures. A minute walk through, so one minute warm up through what we've done before we go further. Good. So I'm importing my numpy as np, and then I'm using np dot array. And here I am considering two sets, wherein my first set is twenty five thousand to thirty two thousand, while my second set has two names, a non integer variable. Okay, within which I have a name and I have a salary. And then because this is my zeroth array and because this is my first array, I am, if you can say I'm interchanging them, I want my name to come first and I want my salary to come next in my table here, which is the reason why I'm taking numpy array of Z of one because of which I'll be having my names first and then my salary next. So guys, these are the different ways you could work on data frame. And what we have seen here is like just the introduction. Data frame can do things much beyond these. And it is also meant to do things which are much beyond these. I hope it suffices. I hope you understand now why and how uh, using a data frame is actually important. Then going into the next topic, uh, which is where we exactly drop that, we would first be understanding merge operation. Or we can also start with join and come back to merge. So we would uh, stick to, uh, okay, give me a second. We'll just spot some basic differences first. So this is my join statement. So difference one, the only uh, thing that we would be changing uh, when we are working on these is you use join here while when you're working on merge, you use merge. And definitely uh, there are some features which differ uh, or some properties which differ, but uh, ideally most of the concept still remains to be the same. Uh, now starting or understanding merge or understanding join to begin with as discussed we have join here right so first so first things first uh, when we talk about a join statement or a join method rather it takes two data frames and joins them on their indexes a very, very important point, guys. Whenever you are working on a join statement, it merges or it kinds of uh, it kinds of you know, it, it, it kind of joins them using their indexes. Technically, you can pick the column to join on uh, for, for for the left or for you know to the right of your data frame. This is the kind of flexibility we have when we use join. And this method, it uses indexes or a specified column from a data frame that is called. Uh, and here you have uh, different variants, like you have left join, right join, and all. But for the right data frame, the join key must be its index. All right. And if you ask me, I personally find it easier uh, to think of join method as joining based on index and to use merge. Uh, if I do not want to join based on indexes. So the simple difference is if it is not indexes as a reference, then you would definitely join. But when we talk about merge, they are used to combine two data frames together, but merge is more versatile uh, at the cost of requiring more detailed inputs. Uh, so when you specify what columns you want to join, do you want it for left or right? Here you can also uh, set them using right index and left index. That's another capability. Uh, now, we let merge know what we want to join on the indexes and we get the same combined data frame as obtained before when we use join. And also merge is useful when we don't want to join based on indexes as we have already discussed. For example, let us say we want to know in percentage terms uh, how much each and every employee has probably given to his organization or what is his contribution to the organization. When I say given, I don't mean a 
and donation or a charity. I mean, what is his contribution to the organization? In 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 such cases, we can use group by uh, to check the sum of the sales, and then we could use recent index to ensure that the data frame has grouped them in order of top to bottom approach. Okay, but uh, I want to also, uh, you know, as we keep going further uh, and, and start working on projects or, or when we start working on machine learning algorithms, you would see that they use or when we start working on uh, depth of uh, data exploration, you would see how the use actually uh, features as a game changing thing. So this is how we could use uh, merge or this is uh, the basic difference between merge and Joint. And just to give you a quick conclusion, or uh, just to give you some similarities uh, between them, or a, a list of similarities and differences between them, both of them can be used to join simple data frames. If it is not very complex and you are not looking for extended uh, operations, then you could use join or merge to combine data and then. The join method, it works best when we are joining data frames on their indexes. And if there is no indexes, or if there is a simple joining based on columns, then you might want to use a merge. And merge has more features as compared to join. Okay, right, there's also something called as concatenate, uh, where in, again, there is a confusion. But concatenate is a simple join. It is it, it just clubs or it kind of brings together two data frames and that's it. You do not have sophisticated features which we use in merge or in join when we talk about concatenate. So these are the differences between them. So now what we'll do is now that we have understood the uh, theoretical part or now that you understood the soft uh, part of it and if you've not I'm sure you would now know where to uh, enter your queries. Let us go on to the hands on part of it. So begins the challenge. Let's get your hands dirty. And for all those of you who are just watching this guys, uh, I would request you to also parallelly try things with me. You could probably create another player or some set of different points or names of cars and then try merging them based on and see or cross check if what you want and what you have are the same or not. So here in my step 27, I'm considering uh, three variables. Wherein the first one is player, the second one is point, and the third one is title with data associated into it. Now, this is all hard coded data, guys. Uh, you could use a data set as well. And please ensure that when you're using data set, or even if you're using a small data that's created by you for the sake of testing, your output should not differ. Or just because you're using a data set, there will be no change in the way of how your system would work when you provide any key terms like data frame or merge, your system would still use the same logic and it would still work the same way. So these are a couple of important things that I want you to know here. Right. So I'm using pd.dataframe and I'm using pd.dataframe. I'm considering three columns. The first column being player, the second being points, and the third being title. And again, I am giving it a comma with indexes. I'm creating three indexes, L1, L2, and L3. And as we all know, indexes are very, very important when you're working on join. Because join, they basically kind of club two data frames or they join two data frames using indexes, using this logic. Like this. So that is very important for us here. Now going forward or going further, let us look at the next one. 
I am also creating another data frame with the name df4, wherein I have a different set of layers powering toggle and a different index set as well. And this different in uh, different index set that I have here is L2, 3, and 4. It was L1, 2, and 3 on the top. It is L2, 3, and 4 at the bottom. Correct? If that is an agreement, now begins the actual part. If you could probably make a note of them, I think it will be more easier for us to understand. So we have L1, L2, L3, and L3. L, so we have 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. So as we all know, 2 and 3 happen to be common between both of them. Correct? And you can see when I use inner join. Correct? That is DF3, which is a new data frame that I'm creating now. I'm using join. I'm using df3 to create a new data frame that is df4 and how do I want it? It would be a inner join. So df3 is getting this is df4, the one earlier is df3. Now this data frame is a new data frame and here you can see I have only the ones which are in common between both of them. So this is how an inner join works. Then I have a left join. Now, when we talk about a left join, again, you can see I have df3 with df4. And it is all only l1, l2, and l3. You would, be not, you would not be having anything from df4, but rather, if there's anything which is common in df3 and df4 from l1, l2, and l3, and not l4, which is a part of df4, that is when you would be having your left join. The guys, so just to make things easy once again, df3 and df4 are being joined. We are using a left join. And in, in left join, you would be having values only getting added into df3. No value of df4 would get populated. Because uh, if you can just cross check in df4, we have l2, l3 and l4. And you can see that you do not have an l4 here at all. That becomes the left join. Then the next one we have is the outer join. There's nothing called as right join in functionality, which you have in merge. Uh, and we would go back to merge and check about it. Cool guys. So that is the important thing here. Now going further, uh -huh. that is okay, outer join and inner join have been covered. Now because they are uh, outer join and inner join are very close to understanding or because they're very close to it, let us also cover concatenate, which is an addition to the section. Concatenate is is simple joining of two data frames. They are as uh, simple and as straight as possible. Okay, there's no huge logic there. Right, so this is how and this is where we would be working or this is how and this is where we would be using concat. Okay, if you do not have any logics, if there is no uh, indexing or you know, if some, some, in that case, you can use from a frame that is DF1 on the top. So when I use DF1, and I use more versatile as compared to there's only which is common in df1 and df2 there is nothing else which is common and please do not consider the indexes because as discussed merge does not use indexes right, guys so here I am considering players with different names and also I have a data frame one and a data frame two these are the two different data frames I have and here I have different players that are associated, wherein player one is the only one. One has power, which is punch, but on the top between, if you are able to notice them properly, they are not exact, uh, very similar to each other. These are the two differences that I want you to mark when we are working or because we are working on these, uh, right? So here I have player one, two, three. 
and now one which are in common between both of them would get populated here i have only player one picture right guys and the only so this is data frame one merging with two and the other is data frame two merging with one so when we go on to the top and check how we created you have player one two three and player one five six and that's just what is being see one two three and one five six correct so they are as simple as that now going forward into the next angle on lines with concat is concatenation Concat is concatenation, simple merge or simple club of uh, two functions, right? We have seen concat at the bottom. So yeah, this is the basic difference between merge and join. Now, after having an explanation and a visual representation between them for last 35 minutes, I hope now the concept of join and the concept of merge have been understood and probably are now clear that we also have seen uh, you know hands-on demonstration of the same okay now let me take you to the next step so this is my next step here and here i'm again uh, we will now be working on this is something that we have checked guys already I would want us to work on data visualization now. Let me just open it up. Cool. We have things on the screen. And here I am. Now it is to be understood whenever we are working on data visualization or whenever we are working on the uh, concepts of plots or whenever we are working on the concepts of stats, it becomes very important for us to see when, where, and how which variant of plot is being used. Right. Now, when we talk about plots, let us just understand some important plots at first uh, to begin with. Uh, we'll just go back to DPT and we'll just, just open this up. So here you see I have around 10 variants or 12 variants of plots that I've come up with. But then guys, not all of these are important. So let us just understand what are some very important variants of plots that we would be using and how do they make a difference and how do we use them or where and when do we use what. Now, when we look at it in detail, I suppose there are more than 50 variants of plots available. But then let us begin with the basics. All right, so I would want to start talking about a pie chart first. Now, when we talk about a pie chart, okay, let us now use a pen as well to make things a bit simple. So I would be explaining each of them. So we, we let us start understanding a bar graph. And we have a bar graph here. This graph that you're looking at is a bar graph. This is the most simplest, the most straightforward, and it's very easy uh, to compare about this graph. And it is a universally recognized graph. Like any person when he looks at it, because it provides a simple comparison. Like a visual comparison, there is no threshold that actually comes into it when you are working on it, but it can visually be understood. Then here you have one axis of the bar which features the categories which are being compared while the other it uses the values. So here I would be having maths, physics, history, 
geography and I would be having 10, 20, 30 and 40. So it will give me my performance of each of them. And we could kind of use this for any kind of data. They are ideal for comparing new values or group sizes or you can also use them for ratings. The next one I want to talk about is a pie chart. This is also a very simple one, but this is used to talk about a whole. Like it gives us an understanding about 100% of the data. So this uh, block here, unit. Which is 100 uh, in total. Now in this 100, this chunk could be 30, this is 20, this is 50, and this is 20. Something like that. I don't exactly mean the figures, but yeah. Guys, so we've understood what is a bar graph and we've understood what is a pie chart. Next is a column or, or a column stack or the way you want to call it. The column uh, charts we all know they are something very important to discuss. Column charts are almost something like bar. In line we have is line chart. Line chart is also very important. But line chart is nothing very complex. They are the most powerful and they are the most used. They are the most used. Okay, and these values or these graphs they are used to understand. You just write it down. They used to understand the trend with uh, respect to time also. Now, I don't mean each and every time, but yes, they can be used in time series analysis also for uh, understanding different insights. Cool. Then the next one that I have is an area chart. So area chart would give me an understanding about the area that is being used and also the underlying area. Now, this is an overarching uh, zone that we are able to look at. And this overarching zone is now understood because of a area chart. Right, guys? So this is what an area chart does. After an area chart, I next have a donut. This is a donut. Donut is almost a pie with a radius in between. If I ensure that this is also taken into consideration, then there is no huge substantial difference between a donut chart and probably a pie chart. Cool. After which we have bubble chart. Now bubble charts are uh, very important and they've been used in a lot of places. Okay, bubble charts can be used to understand where what is happening. Okay, so these show the intensity probably here i have something very intense intense this is very highly intense or this is of low uh, importance high importance things like these can be understood when we use a bubble chart okay then after bubble chart uh, the next one we have is a spider and a radar chart these are uh, used when we work on google maps or maps in short is what I would stick to. We have a scatter plot. Scatter plot is used to check the linearity of a data. Okay, this has this is basically a numerical distribution. This is a comparison chart, uh, as simple as the name can be understood. This is a bar chart, but it is stacked horizontally. And these are gauge charts. But this is not the end of uh, the conversation. As far as graphs and stats are concerned, there are still a lot of other variants that we should be talking about, and we would be doing that right away. And to begin with, some uh, basic charts that we could uh, start our discussion with could be uh, hierarchy charts. We have waterfall charts. Now, waterfall charts are used in accounting for quantitative analysis. Correct. I mean, notwithstanding that, for example, a waterfall could also show how efficiently the you know there's a communication that's happening uh, from you know period to period. 
it is like you know different parts which are floating throughout the graph then you have a hierarchy chart or a hierarchy plot uh, these are used when you might want to uh, kind of structurally organize or structurally show the relationship between different people uh, so this is where you could use hierarchical plots then we all know scatter plot scatter plot is something we've just discussed when there is trellis plot uh, trellis plot is also used uh, generally by statisticians it is to check the comparisons mostly it is also called as a lattice chart and it is to display or compare all those variables uh, wherein you have So here, when we go further, we have a line graph, correct? We've seen that you have cars, HP, um, plot. So this is a line plot or this is a line graph that we have populated on the uh, output. Just like a line graph, I would now come up with another variant of line graph, but a bit complex in nature, and this is also achievable. And how do and uh, rather than how what are we doing here? I'm creating three variables instead of two, wherein I would be having two or multiple elements on my x-axis and numbers on my y-axis. Right? So you can see that here. Please check. I have horsepower and I think this is displacement, both of them into different colors. And how are these colors coming up? Because when you look, take a look at my code, I don't see that I have given orange or blue anywhere. Now, this is happening because of legend. Now, whenever you use legend, it automatically takes colors. Now, if you want this only in red and green, and you can tell your system uh, in this line here that the color is equal to green. Now, these are things which I would uh, kind of request or I would ensure that each and every participant is doing himself post session or with the session. You could always pause the video, try changing colors and post your comments in the comment section below if in case you are having any inconsistencies. The next one we have is an area plot. An area plot is not very different from a bar plot or a line graph or a, a stack plot. They all basically give you the same information just in different ways or in different trends. Right? So here I have my plot dot by plot as PNT. I'm taking Y1 to be my cars within which I'm taking my HP column. Then again, Y2 is taking my DISP column, but I'm just using stack plot. So if we can kind of compare things on the top and bottom, you see that the exoskeleton is the same. It is just that things have been colored here also, or in the area underlying underneath it, things have been colored there or as well. That is the only difference. And how do we use area graph? We just have to use the functionality stack plot and the rest will be taken care of. In the next step, I have area and line plot together just for the sake of cross verification. So here I'm, I'm, I'm importing my library matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And after this, I'm taking my percentage map plot lib in line, after which I'm considering the same three uh, variables, no difference. This is where things change. Or uh, I wouldn't even mind saying that this is a hybrid variant of the earlier two plots. I have a line graph followed by a stack plot, a line graph followed by a stock stack plot for both the values for Y1 and Y2 respectively. So the first two lines are for X and Y1. The second two lines are for X and Y2. So that is an understanding about how we work on different variants of 
device. But now what we'll do is let us go on into understanding some standard variants of plots that we have some some plots which are very important for us to take a look at. Again, guys, this is just an extension or an extended version of what we've already covered in the past. This is not the same, but yes, an extension uh, to a certain extent is a yes. Because we would be looking at greater depths of the same. We would be understanding how things here are different. And from the next session onwards, as discussed, we would have to work a lot on uh, actual uh, hands-on parts of it. So there would be very less theory uh, when we're talking theory, and there would be more of uh, parallel doing that would happen between me and you. Uh, this is the agenda. So talking about this variant, that is a box plot. We all know what box plot is used for and also. Box plot is one of the most informative variant of plots. Right? Box plot does some, does actually generate some huge complex information that is needed for us. Right, and what are all they is what we would see right away. Here in the image below, you can see that I have the upper extent, the lower extent, the median, the mean, the outlier, and where is uh, the you know the where is most of my data falling into, because of which we would also be able to see the skew. We have seen what these terminologies are in great detail in the last session, correct? Which is the reason why we would not be looking at them again right from the scratch. But these are all the informations, uh, or these are all the different uh, information that I get, or that I get to see when we are working on box plot. Going to the next step, I have a violent plot. Now, violent plot is not very different from box plot, but violent plot kind of shows us also the density or the thickness or how dense is your data at which point. So here you can see when I'm talking about this version that is one, I have very less data at the top, very thinly distributed, but here my data is almost equally dense on the top and the bottom. Right, and also we would have the mean and the median, which is shown here also. This is the top part. This is the bottom part. And these, which you are able to see, they represent the mean and the median within your uh, plots. And guys, so that is the most important understanding here. Then in the next one, I have a pie chart. Now, when we talk about a pie chart, it's very easy to construct a pie chart. But there are certain features which might need a bit of understanding, and that is exactly what we will be focusing on right now. Because we've already covered what is a pie chart and how do we work on the coding part of it, I would not really like to emphasize on the same things again. But there are things which we did, which which we left out, uh, kind of in the previous session. So that is exactly what we will be touching base now. So I have a matplotlib.py plot which I'm considering here. And then these are, uh, you know, this is my data that I'm constructing for myself. I hope things here are very uh, straightforward to understand. Then I'm using plt.py. <laughs> plt.py would ensure that I have a pie chart after which I'm taking my sizes. Now, what are the sizes here? You can see sizes are nothing but the values, which is 50, 45, 60, and 80. 
So you see, these are th that is the distribution that's happening here. But we would not see the same values which are written here. We would see that these values are converted into percentages. 80 probably because it's the largest, I think 80 is 34% of the whole data. So what would ideally be happening is whenever you're using a pie chart, your whole data would be considered as one unit. So 50 plus 45 plus 60 plus 80 is considered as one unit and it would show the contribution of each element that is happening within that unit. So dog is contributing by 21%. Uh, wolf, which is the second largest after 34 is contributing with 25. So you see that the numbers here and the ratios here are in equal association only, but they have been converted into percentages considering the whole as one unit. After this, I have auto PCT. Auto PCT is 1.1 F. Now, what do we mean by 1.1 F? 1.1 F is 1.1 float. Now, this means that I have only one decimal value after the main element. Right? That is, I have 21. And this could be 21.325, but it is restricted only to one floating value. And that is because of this functionality here. And that is actually the same for all of these. Then I have shadow is equal to true. Shadow is nothing to do with uh, the technical part of it, guys. It is moreover a look and a feel perspective when we talk about a shadow. And it really is not of huge substantial importance when we are working on pipe plot. It's just a look and feel property. But then start angle is also look and feel. But yes, there is some technical uh, you know, background to this. Let us just understand. So here you see your data is just starting at random. There is no one reference point you can take. Probably you can take this as a reference point. But because we are all you know, kind of visually used to looking at watches or looking when, you know, at things like that. It would be nice if your visual start point is here, somewhere in between. Correct? Now that is the reason why I am taking start angle is equal to my key and I hit an enter. And now you see that this center is my visual start point. Right, guys, I hope that this is understood. Now here in my second step, I'm using a donut chart. And um, this is my donut chart. We have seen what is a donut chart in, in explanation. And when we talk about a donut chart, it is in short two pie charts, one within another. Right. So and how do we know that that it is one within another? It is not just a visual understanding from here. That's not how uh, we developers work. This, if you can see here, would give you a better understanding of the same. Right. Begin. So I have my group name. I have three groups. That's group A, group B, and group C. Then I have group sizes. That is 20, 30, 50. Wherein these would be referring to values below. That is the reason why the one below is like literally occupying 50% of it. Like it is literally occupying 50% of it. This is 20 and this is 20. So this is 30 and this is 20. This is the other uh, pi or the inner circle wherein we have a different color or when we have a different property on the hood. So my pi 1 has group sizes 
which is 203050 uh, also with labels and the labels <coughs> are mentioned here group names so labels is equal to group names and then i'm taking a radius it is because of this radius that you see that this is almost 1.5 and if this is 0 0.3, it means that my pi 2 is 5 times lesser as compared to 5 1. 3 point, 0 0.3 into 5 is 1.5. So that is how it works. So, and the color inside is blue. Now B can also mean black, but we get priority to the Vibgior colors first. And in Vibgior, we have B to be blue. So that is how we uh, have to understand a donut. Right, and then we have an area chart. This is something that we have already created and worked with. So I am using a matplotlib.pyplot as PLT, and here I have my matplotlib inline. I'm considering a range of numbers from 1 to 15, and in my y axis, I'm just taking random elements, just at random, and I would be using a stack plot here. Now, when I'm using a stack plot, I have x comma y, with the color is black, with the color to be black. Uh, now, when I, when we say black, your system would be using this black. Now, this is to be understood as black. It can also be understood as gray, but yeah, I, yeah. So I'm taking an alpha of 0 0.5, which is the intensity. After which I'm using now. Now that this is a stack plot, it is creating the one below all the gray unit. And because of plot, I would be having a line plot, wherein the color is green, and it would be acting as a border onto the stack plot. Right, guys? So this is how both of them would differ, or this is how probably line graph and area graph complement each other. One acts as an exoskeleton while one completes it within. Right. So these are the different variants of plots and stats and graphs we have when we talk about working with pandas and, and also all these which we have, which we spoke about till now are at a very subsurface level, at a very subsurface level. So there are a lot of other things to look at as we keep going further. Right. So if you have any queries with regards to any of these plots or any of these stats or any of these concepts that we've been looking at, then guys, I'm just a message away. All that you'll have to do is ping in the comment section below and we will definitely have one of the teams address to you at the earliest. OK, the next one we have is another variant. You can see we have matplotlib and we have pandas too, which means that they both complement each other. They both are dependent on each other. They both require each other to ensure that both of them are working efficiently. Now, if you are working only on pandas and you don't need or you don't have anything to do with data visualization, in that case, you could choose to ignore matplotlib. But if you are working on pandas and you also have something to do with graphs and stats, in that case, matplotlib becomes a mandate because without matplotlib, it becomes almost difficult for us to come up with graphs and plots. In my next step, I'm using a histogram, uh, which is plt.hist. And we can see here, this is my data set, which is coming from the top. And then I'm considering bins. And bins are being placed at an interval of every 20 numbers. You see, I have 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. So these are the different bins that I'm uh, using. OK. And then I'm taking my edge color and a color. Edge color is white. If you can see, edge color is the one that's at the borders. And it's because of this edge color that I have a white overlay at the ends. Good. And then I'm considering my title, which is going on the top, X label, which is going at the bottom, Y label, which is going on to the left. So X label, Y label, and title are all about look and feel. 
and also they become very important parts of ui ux i mean no graph would be understood without uh, writing or without being understood what x and y axis are okay and then i'm using my plt dot grid uh, within which i would be having my main plot okay now when i when i say main plot these lines which you are seeing here these grids correct these grids are very essential okay let me just mark what is the grid so that we understand so here this is one grid this is another so grid would basically make it easy for me to understand so now i know that this grid is somewhere between 3 and 3.5 okay there are people who find it a bit difficult to understand graphs and plots so if we have things like these it becomes really easy for us to take a look at it so these are the different kinds of you know very basic or you know different uh, plots and stats that i've uh, you know come up with in this session for us and in the upcoming session there are still loads of information that's to be covered so guys i hope now you understood what is merge what is join and how do we work on plotting using pandas and if you have any queries on these then guys please feel free to get back or get in touch with us and also if you found these videos useful or if you found the session interesting and interactive then please hit the like button because that will encourage us to make more videos and more effectively and also do not forget to hit the subscribe button because when you do that you would be having access to a plethora of videos to choose from so this is me or on your trainer your mentor signing off wishing me and all the best in the journey ahead have a great day thank you